Hey, what's going on, gang? This is Nate on the Stone. Welcome to the 32nd episode of The Rolling Stone, where I give you my initial thoughts, opinions, impressions, and analyses about stories that are currently in the news cycle. And we have to start off this video. Our first story for this week is a follow-up to a story that we had last week. If you remember last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the conservative civil war. Uh, the one that was brewing, the one that was coming upon us, especially um, as it was playing out between Turning Point USA, the organization started by Charlie Kirk, and the, call them what you will, the dissident right, the America First crowd, the Groypers, as they have taken to call themselves, uh, nominally led by Nick Fuentes. Remember that? Well, our first story this week is a follow-up. To that, okay? Because Turning Point USA, they arranged for Donald Trump Jr., the son of President Trump, and Trump Jr.'s uh, girlfriend, Kimberly Girlfoyle, uh, to come on to the University of California Los Angeles campus. It was going to be a Turning Point USA event. Charlie Kirk was going to play moderator between Trump Jr. and Trump Jr.'s girlfriend, Gilfoyle. And the whole purpose, the main purpose of this um, outing was to uh, get attention, draw attention to uh, Trump's newly published book called Trigger, which is basically um, a book explaining why the left hates the right and why the left wants to silence conservative voices. You know, I, I personally haven't read it, but just from reading about it, it sounds like, you know, nothing maybe spectacularly new or original, but, you know, it's guaranteed to generate sales, especially because he is the son of the sitting president. Well, a few days before this event took place at um, the University of California, Los Angeles, at UCLA, Turning Point USA announced that there was going to be no Q&A at the end of the session with Trump Jr. and Guilfoyle because they had heard that a group of these Groypers, America First people, were actually going to try and uh, disrupt the proceedings. So Turning Point USA said, no Q&A. It's just going to be Trump Jr. and Guilfoyle talking about Trump's book, talking about the left and the right, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then everyone is going to go home. Well, the day of the event came, and these America First people found out that the Q&A had actually been canceled, and they raised holy hell about it. While the venue, while it was actually going on, Okay, there were a couple of chants of USA, which then actually changed to QNA. QNA. Trump Jr. originally thought that um, the people shouting QNA were actually liberals, that they were actually progressive college students from um, UCLA, which wouldn't be surprising or hard to round up. And it was only later. You know, after a few minutes, that they actually found out, oh, no, these are actually conservatives, but they're not Turning Point USA conservatives. They're over here. They're part of the dissident right. And a lot of people just got mad. Because, first of all, the, di the, uh, the dissident right people, they were drowning out Trump and Guilfoyle. Nobody could hear what they were saying. Guilfoyle actually lost her temper big time. She lost her cool completely with these people. She said uh, at one point, quote, I bet you engage and go online dating because you're impressing no one here to get a date in person. That's pretty harsh, okay? <laughs> That's, ooh, that's, that's below the belt. And th there's a stigma now about online dating. I guess there always has been a stigma with online dating. People somehow seem to think, even though this is the 21st century and we are neck deep in the digital age, people somehow think that if you go online 
to to date somehow you're some sort of a loser because you can't get a girl in person i i don't know but after she said that soon after she said that they actually walked off the stage these groipers brought an end to this turning point usa event with trump jr and his girlfriend because of their cries of q a and their outrage over the fact that the q a had been canceled now the big thing to take away from here is that both sides were wrong okay the dissident right was wrong because for my money from where i'm sitting i don't care how upset you are about the q a getting canceled and we're going to get to that in a minute but i don't care how upset you are you don't drown out people okay especially especially when supposedly they're people that you support some people were actually pointing out the uh contradiction here because nick fuentes by his own admission is a big fan of president trump and trump jr so people were saying well if you're such big fans why did your people push him off the stage by drowning him out and nick fuentes had to go on twitter to do some damage control for lack of a better word and pretty much say no 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 no. we weren't protesting trump jr we love trump jr he's a patriot we were protesting charlie kirk turning point usa and their specific decision to cancel the q a okay fair enough but the end result was the same thing the event was prematurely ended because Trump Jr. and his girlfriend, the people that supposedly you admire and love, got up and left, not because of the left, but because of what you were doing. That's on you guys, okay? Not exactly good optics. However, on the other hand, like they say in Fiddler on the Roof, Turning Point USA basically i can't i'm not going to bring my foot up here but they basically took their hand took a gun put gun against said hand and went bang and because they're not eric draven they're not the crow um they didn't just automatically heal this did a lot of damage to them okay because it it sent a message of weakness to everyone it sent a message of weakness i really hate uh these sort of mental exercises because we all know what the answer is but i'm going to engage in it just just this once if there had been some progressive um you know, gathering or some sort of uh liberal get together like in, in the same vein of Trump Jr.'s uh, book tour here at UCLA with Turning Point USA. And there had originally been planned to be a Q&A session and then it was announced that it was canceled. People like Charlie Kirk would be at the front of the line saying, why do they cancel the Q&A? Why are you afraid of people asking questions? Do you not have faith in your ideas? Do you not want a debate? Are we all just supposed to accept your ideas as gospel? Why don't you want a debate? Why are you trying to silence people and stifle free thought? And Charlie Kirk and everyone else with him would be completely right in asking that question. But those same barbs that they would hurl to the progressives and onto the left are applicable here. Why, Turning Point USA, were you afraid of questions? Why were you afraid of debate? Why did you think that the only solution was to shut the whole thing down and therefore clamp down on people's questions, right? And free speech, if we want to take it in that direction. And some people might say, well, you, these people weren't wanting to, didn't want to ask serious questions. Um, they were just wanting to take over the event and get some, uh, you know, get some videos to put on Instagram and Twitter and Gab and Twitch and everything and, uh, and get clicks that way. Maybe. 
we'll never know for sure because the Q&A was canceled, but even if that was true, Turning Point USA should not have canceled the Q&A. Why? Because, again, of the optics. It's a sign of weakness. Because, here's the thing, the only way that you are actually going to defeat, if you're Turning Point USA and you realize that the dissident right is kind of hog in onto your territory, the only way that you're going to defeat them is through debate. What the right has been saying for years and years and years. The right has made a motto of saying, you know, we have to engage in the arena of ideas. The arena of ideas. I'm sure you've heard of the arena of ideas. We have to meet in the arena of ideas. And when we do, honestly and fairly, then the best ideas are going to win. Oh, and by the way, we have the best ideas, so it's a sense we're going to win. But here, okay, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. So you can't win because we don't know now whose ideas are the best because they're not allowed to actually fight. It's hypocritical, it's dishonest, and it is a sign of weakness. And it really shows, it really shows something that Robert Greene has talked about. Robert Greene, I cannot recommend his books enough. He's written books such as The 48 Laws of Power, The 33 Strategies of War. His most recent book uh, is The Laws of Human Nature. Brilliant. He takes philosophy, philosophers, uh, stories from history. He distills and crystallizes them to come up with these axioms for life. So whether you want to gain power, whether you're trying to win a war, or whether you just want to know how to win a war, how to win a battle, or how people gain power, so you can recognize that in the wider world. That's what his books are for. I cannot recommend his books enough. Robert Greene. Well, in one of his books, The 33 Strategies of War, Robert Greene says that people can be divided roughly, but fairly accurately, between Marie Antoinette's and Napoleon Bonaparte's. People like Marie, uh, people who are Marie Antoinette's, they think that the way things are, are the way things are going to stay forever. Things are not going to change. Napoleon Bonaparte's know that everything can change at the turn of a dime, the snap of a finger. So they are always prepared. They're always wet ready okay and waiting for the status quo to change what happened here turning point usa and conservatism incorporated okay to use that general umbrella term showed themselves to be marie antoinette's okay the status quo is the way things are always going to be they're always going to be at the top of the conservative movement it's going to be their ideas which are going to be accepted and that's just the way it's going to be. Now, again, I don't care whether you support Turning Point USA and Charlie Kirk or the dissident right and the Groypers and Nick Fuentes. I don't care. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you're Turning Point USA, you have to engage. You actually have to practice what you preach and enter into the arena of ideas and have your ideas engage with the ideas of the dissident right. And that this is not just necessary, you know, if Turning Point USA wants to save, you know, a shred of dignity and a shred of their influence, but also for the right in general. Because as I said last week, and I will repeat it again because it needs to be repeated, the right needs to have an actual unifying vision. Right now, it doesn't because there are contradictory ideas that are trying to fight, but even that is being stifled, okay? And you can't move forward. Your movement cannot gain momentum unless there is some sort of unifying vision. And the nebulous, vague platitudes that we've heard for decades, you know, freedom, free markets, um, you know, individualism, it's not cutting it anymore. And there has to be something more. It's not unifying anymore on the right. And so some serious philosophical dis discussion has to take place. And again, um, the sooner that Turning Point USA and Conservatism Incorporated, again to use that phrase, realizes that, 
the better it's going to be because then the faster we can actually start having those discussions and actually gain momentum uh, on the right. But that is story number one. Story number two keeps us in Los Angeles. We were in Los Angeles at UCLA. We're going to stay in Los Angeles for our second story. Um, do you know the name Heidi Van Tassel? I'm going to guess that you probably don't. Uh, even though that is a name that everyone should be talking about right now. Heidi Van Tassel, I just love that name. It sounds like she stepped out of one of Washington Irving's stories. And after what happened to her this past week, I'm willing to bet that she wishes that she was a character from one of Washington Irving's stories. Or at the very least that she was a, a contemporary of Washington Irving's. Because if she had been, w what happened to her this past week wouldn't have happened. So, what happened? On Sunday, in Hollywood, Hollywood, USA, Tinseltown, right? The golden, the, the golden palace, the place where dreams come true, fantasies are real. That Hollywood. Heidi Van Tassel and some friends were leaving a Thai restaurant, an authentic Thai restaurant, I will be quick to add, Sunday evening. And Heidi Van Tassel got into her car. But before she could really do anything, this homeless man with a bucket in his hand, okay, ran up to her, pulled her out of her car, threw her on the ground, and then just, I mean, threw and poured the contents of the bucket onto her. Now, what was in this bucket? And you can already guess from where, from how I have set up this story that what was in the bucket wasn't very nice. Uh, was it sewage water? Was it, you know, animal intestines? Was it a garbage that had been sitting, you know, for however long? Those are all good guesses. They would all be wrong. You want to know what was in the bucket? Do you really want to know, like they say in the X-Files? Okay. The bucket was full of diarrhea. This homeless man threw a full bucket of diarrhea onto Heidi Van Tassel. A bucket that was so voluminous that the authority said that this guy must have been collecting it for at least a month. You know, every time, you know, he had a little um, a spell, uh, shall we say, had a little bout of diarrhea, he sat down on the bucket and uh, just let it sit in age, like some sort of perverted bottle of wine. Now, Heidi Van Tassel is okay. She was rushed to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital because, of course, they had to test her for infectious diseases to see if she had contracted anything from this disgusting attack. And now her life has, in a sense, been fundamentally altered because even though, last I read in the Los Angeles Times, she had not been infected, she has to go back to the hospital every three months to be checked again because some of these diseases have, you know, long incubation periods. So they have to make sure every three months now that she's not sick because of this attack. Now the huge, glaring question that this story raises is what the hell is the use of living in civilization if attacks like this are going to happen? Seriously, what's the point of living in civilization? Okay? Remember, if you go all the way back to uh, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, Aristotle said that political society, civilization, it's natural, meaning that men are going to uh, just you know, men don't have to be forced to come together and form political societies to form civilizations. They're just going to do that of their own nature because man, man's nature is a rational animal, which makes him a political animal as well, Aristotle would argue. And even though she is not at all an Aristotelian, uh, Camille Paglia says much the same thing. She says that civilization acts as a shield against nature because forget about how Walt Disney portrayed nature in his movies, okay? Nature is cruel. She can be 
abrupt, she can be unpredictable, and she can be vindictive. Now, she's not mother nature, okay? I, I disagree with Paglia on this, and, and all people who describe nature as mother nature. Um, I tend more towards G.K. Chesterton's observation that nature is actually uh, a sister to us and a little sister at that, which honestly just makes her more terrifying because if she's a mother, then she has some sort of restraint because most normal mothers don't want to punish their children. They you know, they don't want to kill their children. A little sister, if you have a little sister, I've got one. If you have a little sister, you know how angry and how vindictive they can become and they can just plow through your life like a hurricane or like a tornado right but camille paglia would say whether it's mother nature or little sister camille paglia would say that civilization is set up to act as a shield to protect us from nature both you know outside forces like storms floods volcanoes things like that but also the wild nature that's in ourselves, uh, the id, as we might say, the uncontrolled, you know, untempered uh, passions that we all have inside of us, right? So, um, if, if civilization isn't going to actually protect us from these sort of attacks, from these sort of acts of nature right being exhibited in human beings then what's the point there is absolutely no advantage to living in civilized society civilized society which is supposed to you know, protect our dignity it's supposed to protect our property it's supposed to protect our rights and it's also supposed to give us the parameters we need to um, execute our duties the duties that we have because of our rights if civilization fails in all those issues and things like this can just happen to anybody just as they're walking around town doing their own business, minding their own business, then we might as well all still be swinging from trees or living in caves, right? Honestly, when something like this happens, civilization becomes a joke. Now that's the first, that's the, that's the first big, huge reveal of this story. But it gets even worse than that because there are two responses to an attack like this. Now, the first response would be the response of the newly elected district attorney of San Francisco, Mr. Uh, Chesa Bowden, who ran and won on a platform of saying that quality of life crimes in San Francisco are no longer going to be prosecuted. And what are some of these quality of life crimes? Well, they include things like public urination, solicitation of sex public encamping meaning you know just setting up a, a tent or a teepee in the middle of the road or the middle of the street late at night when i went to san francisco this past may for the uh demand uh, free speech event i actually saw this walking back to um my hotel room my very first night there in San Francisco, I saw this. People just camping out on the sidewalks and on the streets as I was stepping over the needles and the feces and everything else. This is actually what I saw. J.C. Bowden has said that the city, under him as district attorney, is not going to prosecute these sort of crimes anymore because, don't you know, they're just going to target the homeless disproportionately, and that's not fair to them. Now, when you do something like this, when you say that these sort of crimes are not going to be prosecuted, what you're doing is actually you are encouraging more crimes like that because people are going to say, hey, we can get away with this. Why not do this? Why not sink to that lowest common denominator? And what that means is that the city doesn't give a damn about the the poor people who, the poor homeless people who are actually living like this, who are actually acting like this, you can keep living in your squalor. Nor do they care about the poor schmoes who actually have to live in the same areas where these crimes are being committed. Huh, you know what? Your rights, your duties, your property, and all that stuff, eh, that's not important to us. We have our own caste. 
that we're taking care of. Thank you very much. Uh, the people who can afford to pay three, four, five thousand dollars a month just in rent, and so they don't have to deal with problems like this. Those are the people that we care about, not the poor people who are actually living in this filth, in their own filth, or the people who have to live in their filth with them. Um, that's the first response to this sort of attack, to this uh, attack by Diarrhea Man. But the second one is just as bad. It leads just to another uh, dead end. Because the other response you could have is some pointy-headed councilman saying, by God, we've got to pass a law to make it illegal for someone to dump a bucket of diarrhea onto someone else. We have to have a law, a city ordinance, that specifically says you cannot dump a bucket of diarrhea onto another person. When you have to do that, you've already lost. Because if, you get, if it gets to the point where you have to pass a law like that, what you are admitting is that the fabric of society has already become unwoven. And it's already collapsing. Because here's the thing. You're not supposed to have to have laws against every single immoral thing. That's where the family, that's where religion, that's where community, that's where tradition comes in. Right? That's where virtue comes in. And I'm not just talking about you know, the classical virtues as were uh, portrayed by um, the Roman Republic at its very finest. I'm not even talking about the Christian virtues or even the fusion of the classical and the, and the Christian virtues as what happened in the founding. I'm talking about just the lowest common denominator, common decency, common sense sort of virtues, like holding the door for elderly people, just common decency things, things that everybody used to do just automatically because that's how the way that because that's the way that they were raised. When you're saying that even that has been eradicated and you have to replace that with a law, you are saying that the foundation of society, one of the planks, one of the pillars is gone because people cannot think in a decent, commonsensical way. No matter how low of a denominator you go, the only thing that they will respond to is the force of law. And so no matter which choice you make, you are really staring at the unraveling of society. It might be on a microcosmic level. You might just say, well, it's LA, you know, it's California. But this is still one of the biggest cities in the world's lone superpower. And this sort of thing happens, this sort of thing, not to be, you know, insensitive or anything, but this is really something that you would expect to read about in some war-torn, you know, country in maybe Central Africa or Asia or someplace not like that, not in Los Angeles, United States of America in the 21st century. But... That is story number two. Our third and final story for this video of the Rolling Stone takes us from California, Los Angeles, specifically to Dallas, Texas. Thanksgiving is coming up, and with it is going to come uh, the uh, Thanksgiving Day football game where one of the contestants is going to be the Dallas Cowboys. Now, for the halftime show of this uh, football game for the Feast of Thanksgiving, the uh, NFL and the Dallas Cowboys, they had recruited, they have recruited the talents of a uh, British singer, Ellie Golding, okay? I've personally never heard of her. And she was working with the Dallas Cowboys uh, for their Red Kettle kickoff, specifically. So she was going to sing at uh, the halftime show right at the thanksgiving football game with the dallas cowboys the dallas cowboys are going to help use the uh, proceeds there for their uh, red kettle kickoff which is actually a fundraiser that they have hosted since 1997 for the salvation army okay however now ellie golding is saying that she is going to back out of this uh engagement 
unless the Salvation Army promises to donate a sizable portion of the proceeds to the LGBTQ community. How did all this happen? She went on to Instagram where she said, I'm so excited to be working with the Dallas Cowboys and the Salvation Army because they do so much good. And her fans, her followers just went bonkers saying, the Salvation Army is homophobic, the Salvation Army is transphobic. And that's when she did this about face and said, oh, okay, I'm going to back out of this completely unless the Salvation Army promises to um, dedicate a sizable pro uh, portion of the proceeds to the LGBTQ community. Only one problem with that the Salvation Army is neither homophobic nor transphobic. I mean, did you know, for example, the Salvation Army has uh, said this. One third of uh, 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 transgender people have been removed from homeless shelters because, again, you know what? They are biological men posing as women, trying to get into women's shelters or vice versa. And these shelters were saying, no, we, 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 we can't do that because this is just for women. We do not want our women having to share spaces with biological men who are just presenting themselves as women. So the Salvation Army actually created a homeless dorm specifically for transgender people in Las Vegas. Does that sound transphobic to you? No, that's because they're not transphobic. They're just trying to help people who are homeless, who are poor, who are destitute, wherever they are from whatever walk of life that they come from, which is shown too by what they do with their Red Kettle kickoff, which is part of uh, one of their fundraisers and donations. Like I said, they have, in the past, they have been able to raise $2.4 billion that has gone to toys for poor kids, kids who are impoverished, kids who, without the Salvation Army, probably wouldn't have much of a Merry Christmas. It goes into getting people shelter during the cold winter months. It goes to getting people food for the cold weather months, particularly around Thanksgiving and Christmas time, when again, without the Salvation Army, these people would not have a happy Thanksgiving. They would not have a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year. Again, that is where this money go is this is where this money goes towards. And this is the charity, this is the fundraiser that Ellie Golding was going to help promote by performing at the halftime show at Thanksgiving. So all of this, okay, all of this, the good that the Salvation Army does with this money that Ellie Golding by performing was going to help raise for them, as well as just the fact that they are not homophobic or transphobic in any way, shape, or form, proves again my mantra. I have said it before, gang. I am going to say it again because this story illustrates it. Ideologues do not care about people as people. They might care for something called humanity. They might care for groups in the abstract, but they don't care about people because if they actually cared about people, first of all, her followers wouldn't have berated her for taking part in a charitable organization that helps the poor, the homeless, and poor kids. They wouldn't have done it. And then Ellie Golding wouldn't have been like a Pavlovian dog. And when her followers rang those bells, she wouldn't have reacted in this way. She would have done her own research or she would have just said, you know, or she just would have said, you know what? Buzz off, people. I am here because we are helping children, the homeless, the destitute, the starving, all the people that you say are in the shadows in society. I'm actually partnering with the Salvation Army and the Dallas Cowboys to actually help these people, particularly during the festive season of the year. So you can go and take your virtue signaling somewhere else. She could have said that, but again, no. The ideology, the ideology is what is important, okay? So it's going to be really interesting. I'm gonna keep my eye out on this story and we're going to see if she actually pulls out or not. So 
No, poor kids, starving people, homeless people, are they important enough just where they are? Are they important enough to actually help raise money for them? Or is it not woke? Is, is partnering, helping the Salvation Army do this, is it so unwoke? Is it so terrible that you can only partner with them if they actually promise to devote a sizable portion of the proceeds to one particular group? That's the real question. Um, I have a bad feeling what the answer is going to be, but you know what? Maybe we'll have a little early Christmas miracle. But as usual, gang, I have been talking for too long, so I am wrapping up the video here. So have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday. Ciao.